Welcome into the latest edition of College Football Smothered and Covered. My name's Barrett Salee. I appreciate you checking out the show, episode 22 of College Football Smothered and Covered. And for those who don't know, this is a revamped version, a restarted version of a show that I had back from 2016 to 2018 called SEC Smothered and Covered. That had to go away for reasons that I'm still not happy about, but we brought it back in February. Now it's March 1st. Had a great, great reception from you guys. I really appreciate you subscribing on YouTube, subscribing on Rumble, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of those places. I really do appreciate it and hope to make this show bigger and better than it has been so far and what it was before the break. And if you have thoughts, leave them a, leave a review. YouTube, Apple if you want to rate it five stars, great. If you want to rate it one star, totally cool with that. And so, look, I, this is, we're all one family. The entire college football podcast and YouTube streamer world, we're all big. We're all a big family. Uh, and so, if if you want to listen to Pate, do it. If you want to listen to Cover 3, do it. If you want to listen to SDS, do it. Michael Bratton, let's all come together and enjoy the greatest sport on earth. Although, college football playoff administrators are making it really hard right now. If you missed my rant about the college football playoff selection committee, I'm not selection committee. If you missed my rant about the administrators, the board of managers, go back to yesterday's show. There's a lot of fire and, and an airheads reference. For those of you who remember that phenomenal Brendan Fraser, Steve Buscemi, Adam Sandler flick from the early 90s. Hey, check out my friends at Breaking Tea. BreakingTea.com slash smothered and covered. BreakingTea.com slash smothered and covered. This is a Travion Henderson uh, uh, shirt they've got out uh, on their site. Look, that you wear the moment with Breaking Tea. You also have NIL opportunities with current college players. You also have historic shirts that you can't find anywhere else. BreakingT.com slash smothered and covered. And if you look at me, if you like a Bra like the Braves, 755 forever because we all know that Hank Aaron is the true home run king. You can get this shirt there as well. Just go to BreakingT.com slash Barrett, BreakingT.com slash Barrett, and you can get that as well. Speaking of Ohio State, it's what we call a segue in this business. Speaking of Ohio State, we're going to talk about college football playoff odds. And, and these are from Bet Online. They came out a couple days ago. And I want to talk about these from betonline.ag. And I think the first thing you see when you look at these odds is you're like, holy crap. Some of these teams have really short odds. Now, keep in mind, this is not to win the national championship. This is just to make the college football playoffs. So you have to factor in, hey, what conference are they in? Who is their opposition? Can they get one of those four automatic bids or five automatic bids, I should say? And if they don't, where can they finish? That's why Kansas State's in there at negative two hundred minus two hundred. That's why Utah and Arizona, or Utah's there at minus one one ten. Miami at one minus plus one hundred. I have no idea why Miami's in there, actually, to be honest with you. But here they are. Um, so and Colorado's at plus two thousand. It got cut off by the by the ticker at the bottom, which is just simply insane. But let's start with Ohio State minus nine hundred. <laughs> I mean, look, minus nine hundred is terrible odds. I would never actually bet that because I do think Ohio State's going to make the college football playoff. And I think when it comes to um, odds, I, you have to pick them because they're going to be one of the top two, maybe three Big Ten teams. There are going to be two or three Big Ten teams in it this year. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So Ohio State, terrible value. Terrible, terrible value. With that said, let's talk a little bit about the Buckeyes. Because Henderson, we saw his shirt from Breaking Tea earlier in this show. Quinshawn Judkins is there. Caleb Downs is there. It's a complete football team. A complete football team. I think by far and away, they should be the Big Ten favorite. We went over conference championship odds earlier this week. They are the favorite. Um, so as long as they make the smart decision with Will Howard 
they can be a national championship caliber team. But even if they don't, and for those of you who have missed the 21 previous episodes of this show, go back. I am not a Will Howard fan. He was not going to win the job at Kansas State. I don't think he should be the starting quarterback at Ohio State this year, whether that's Julian Salen, Aaron Nolan, Devin Brown, whatever. I don't care. I don't think he fits what Ohio State wants to do. With that said, even if Ryan Day doesn't do the right thing and does start Will Howard, they're still going to make the playoff. They're still going to make the playoff. So minus 900 to make it, especially with all of the new players that have come in since the end of the season. I think it'd be irresponsible uh, to think that they wouldn't. Now, Ohio State fans, I know what you're going to say. And you're going to say, hey, we got on you at the end of January when you didn't put Ohio State in the playoff. Well, that was before the mass influx of talent. That was before the mass influx of players who can make a huge difference and make things put put this put Ohio State in a situation where they absolutely can not only make the playoff but win it. Let's talk a little bit more about this though because Oregon at minus 450. I think that like I think that right now with what Dan Lanning has done. There's a reason Alabama wanted Dan Lanning. Because he understands how you win in college football now is you win at the line of scrimmage. They've done that consistently. He continues to cr- recruit players that can win the battle in the trenches. And in the Pac-12, it worked great. Now, I, I get it that they, they didn't make the playoff. But in the Pac-12, being able to compete consistently is because they were able and are able to win the ba- line, win at the line of scrimmage. Now, that was except against Washington. But that offensive line won the Joe Moore Award. And... Sometimes you just run into a buzzsaw. Now, Oregon at minus 450. Keep in mind, this is to make the college football playoff, but not win it. And that's the nuance of this discussion. Because at minus 450, getting in is fine. Dylan Gabriel, we talked about this earlier, uh, I guess it was last week, that you know he's third in Heisman Trophy odds. I think that's insane. I don't trust Dylan Gabriel. So picking Oregon to win the national championship, I think is is insane. Because A, it's going to be strength on strength for Oregon in the Big Ten, certainly uh, on a week-in, week-out basis in the trenches. And B, I think Dylan Gabriel is a, a quarterback who's above average, maybe at times great, but not elite. I think Dylan Gabriel is a player who can win you a ton of football games. Can he win you two or three when it matters most against great competition in a 12-team college football playoff? No, I don't think that he can. And so that's why when we're talking about contenders and pretenders in the race for the playoff and the race for the national championship, I think Oregon is a pretender in terms of winning the national championship, but not only a contender, but I would say almost a shoe-in to make the college football playoff. So if you want to go grab Oregon minus 450, I'm with you. I think that's a great idea. Now, last team or la- last team before we get to Todd Furman, we're going to talk to Todd Furman, former Caesars odds maker, about all this stuff. Maybe not specifically about teams, but just how Odds in this time of year are created. Different things that have changed as sports betting has become more legal or legal in a lot of states and more accepted throughout the course of the or throughout the country. Um, but let's look at these odds. And one that I'm absolutely fascinated with. Well, I'm Alabama and Ole Miss for sure. But Penn State at plus 150. I'm not the biggest Drew Aller guy. I don't think anybody can be a Drew Aller guy. I don't know how anybody is a Drew Aller guy. But kind of like Oregon, I think Penn State can win in the trenches. And I think they have a really good job to maybe finish third in the Big Ten ahead of Michigan. Yes, I think Penn State might be able to finish third in the Big Ten ahead of Michigan. 
that'll get them in. And I think Penn State, in terms of these odds, at plus 150, you put up 100 bucks to make 150. I think that's worth it. I think that's worth it. Because there's no way in hell Penn State is a national championship contender. However, could they slide in and be one of the best teams? One of, one of not the one of the best teams in the Big Ten? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the last team on this. One spot behind Penn State, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Now, Notre Dame is the most polarizing team in all of college football. Yes, more polarizing than Alabama. There's this idea that Notre Dame is always overrated. That is false. That is false. Typically, going into the season, they're top 10, top 12, top 15. And where do they end? Top 10, top 12, top 15. The two numbers there in that string of three are the most important. 10, 12. How many teams are in the playoff? 12. So you're getting, you're getting value with Notre Dame here at plus 200. This is a team, and look, I, I hate his, uh, referencing history in terms of college football because things change so much, but you're talking about Notre Dame that has made the playoff twice, made the BCS championship game. Like, If you do that, you're one of the best teams in the country, certainly one of the top 12 teams in the country. So don't get blinded by your Notre Dame hate. Do not get blinded by your Notre Dame hate. They will make the 2024 college football playoff. I firmly believe that with Riley Leonard at quarterback, with what Marcus Freeman has done, how they continue to build along the line of scrimmage. That's a playoff caliber team. And check out this schedule. At Texas A&M, not terribly worried about that. I don't think Texas A&M, this is from fbschedules.com, by the way. I'm not that worried about Texas A&M. If Notre Dame's going to make the playoff, if Notre Dame is going to make the college football playoff, all they have to be is a two-loss team. If Notre Dame's going to make the playoff, be a two-loss team. You're in. You're in. You don't have to worry about a conference championship game, which is huge in this era. And that's why the Notre Dame administration was all aboard the 12-team playoff, despite the fact that they simply cannot earn a first-round buy. They don't care. They don't have a conference championship game. This system is set up perfectly for Notre Dame, and this schedule is set up perfectly for Notre Dame. Where are the three losses? Because that's going to be what keeps them out of the college football playoff. Not Texas A&M. I know it's in Kyle Field. Not worried about that. Louisville's at home. Okay, Louisville's all right. Notre Dame will be a six, seven point favorite in that one. Florida State's at home. Okay, Florida State's lost basically everybody. At USC, not worried about that because I don't think USC plays defense. So where are the three losses? They don't exist. And that's why Notre Dame is going to be a college football playoff team in 2024. Joined now by my good friend, Todd Furman. You can hear him on Bet the Board. You can see him on CBS Sports Q, former odds maker out in Las Vegas. If it's gambling, Todd knows everything about it because Todd is the best in the business. What's going on, man? Not much, man. This is a, a little bit of the calm before the storm. <laughs> you get stuck in the eye post-Super Bowl. Everybody is clearly cramming for the upcoming NCAA tournament, but I like a little lull in the sports calendar in late February, early March. It allows me to focus on a couple other pursuits. And most importantly, as you know, Barrett, after football season is over, all of us in this business, whether it's on the pure journalism side or gambling, need a little bit of that coveted R&R. &R. Well, you know what? I went skiing last week. I'm going to Disney World next week. It's like the only time in the calendar where like, we can actually go on vacations as you, family. So, You know what, though? I, I have to ask you this question. I don't have kids of my own, but is going to Disney really a vacation for mom and dad, or does that end up adding more stress? I feel like you getting away to an SEC venue on your own during college football season is more relaxing than having to schlep the kids to Disney 
and everything that comes along with it. So here's the thing. Uh, for most families, it's awful. but And it's still awful for me some, at times. But my wife is a travel agent, and she specializes in Disney. And she's actually planning a trip for Glenn Schumann, the defensive coordinator for Georgia right now. So it's a tax write-off because we're I like it. See? working. That's, that's Don't next tell the level IRS. stuff. You get the fast pass in there. You write it off under a T&E line item. That's and right. All the rest is gravy. The way that's I right. Plus, they like everywhere except the Magic Kingdom. It's like an airport, right? Like, where can you drink at like seven o'clock in the morning <laughs> and people like totally understand? Like, airports and Walt Disney World. Like, it's just hey. like you're like I see. Oh, a ja a frozen Jack and Coke at ten a.m. Deal. I'm in. <laughs> It is the perfect breakfast accompaniment for a 7,000 calorie funnel cake loaded with chocolate syrup, powdered sugar, and everything else you can get in your system. <laughs> a true diabetic's delight at 10 a.m. so good. So good. All right. So earlier in the show, Todd, we, we showed some uh, futures on making the college football playoff. It, you know, I, to me, these are all about entertainment, um, especially because the transfer portal window still exists. And we're still having coaching changes right now. But um, in terms of evaluating teams this time of year, as opposed to 10 years ago, how has it changed? And how do you approach something like this? You know, honestly, you have to be that much more aggressive. And I think that pertains to both the odds making side of things. And if you're going to be a better, I mean, I work with some of the sharpest guys in the space that have fine tuned their power numbers after the first wave of the transfer portal, and they're ready to pounce on some of the win totals that are already up at various shops. Now, I know they'll take lower limits, and things will sharpen up as we get deeper into the summer. You mentioned it, the second transfer portal window, because Lord only knows what these rosters are going to look like <laughs> for some of the top teams, how these coaching staffs are going to get assembled, and what can change from now until these teams start to convene on campus uh, in the middle of the summer months, getting ready for kickoff Labor Day weekend. So, it has really become an elongated sports betting calendar for college football fans because years ago, Barrett, when I was behind the counter at Caesars, and it feels like an eternity ago <laughs> where I can be the old man, get off my lawn type stuff, we wouldn't put win totals up until early August. Maybe when we were ultra aggressive, some books would come out a few weeks earlier, and you weren't rolling them out for 100 plus programs. It was the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Floridas, the Florida states of the world. And you were hoping that with 10 to 15 win totals, you gave your customers an amenity that they could take advantage of. Now it's really an arms race. Not only do we get win totals earlier, national championship odds, which is an easier market to set. You mentioned odds to make the college football playoff. We have games of the year. And we're not talking about just the Alabamas versus Georgias. You can bet Colorado against North Dakota State that opening <laughs> weekend of the season if your true degenerate heart is so inclined. You can bet Heisman Trophy now, too. And it's so interesting to me because before the transfer portal window closed, there were players who you didn't even know where they were going to play. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it's so different now. So when you see a player transfer, right, when you see somebody, like, let's just use an example, DJ Uyunglele go into Florida State or, or pick a player, doesn't matter. How different is it? How hard is it to actually pinpoint where to put his Heisman Trophy odds considering you don't even know how he's going to play in that system and you don't even know what players are going to be around him? Right. That's the big thing with a lot of it. And, you know, on some level, you'll see odds makers do everything they can to kind of suppress the ceiling instead yeah. of offering massive long shot prices. I mean, you look at the board now, they're household names in power programs. You're Dylan Gabriel's of the world. You're Will Howard mm -hmm. walking into a ready-made situation potentially. Quinn Ewers is going to be all the buzz in burnt orange. And these are players that you may see their numbers continue to drift out, even with one poor performance. But books aren't going to accumulate that level of liability. And if we even want to stay in the SEC, I mean, Nico and I am a Vela, and I'm going to butcher his name about 37 <laughs> times now before the season starts. I mean, this was a guy I watched against Iowa, and I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe I'm going to be able to get 40 or 50 to one on him in the Heisman market if he doesn't start knowing the level of athleticism he brings. And while he won't be a polished passer, but you look around, most books have him in that 10 or 12 to one range. Yeah. Am I going to go in with an unproven commodity and tie up my money for nine plus months? Absolutely not uh, in a market like this. Now, where I do think it gets interesting, Barrett, is if you have you know a little bit of inside intel or you want to try and speculate some, if you feel there's a quarterback with a skill set that could be on the move, whether he's a G5 guy 
looking to upgrade or something along those lines, that's where you can lock in a little bit of value. Uh, and full disclosure, I tried to do that last year. It didn't quite work out for me. But when there were rumblings about Tyler Van Dyke potentially leaving Miami to go to Alabama to yeah. take over his QB1 there, you know, I would have been a fool not to try and at least grab a little bit of him at 200 to 1 for small stakes. And even when Miami start off hot with that big win against Texas A&M, I mean, Van Dyke's odds got as low as 25 to 1. We know how the season ended, as it pretty much does every year for a quarterback <laughs> in Mario Cristobal's system. Uh, but that's where you have to be a, as much a speculator as a handicapper trying to get ahead of the moves, knowing that Heisman Trophy odds are as volatile as any in the sport, given the fact that it's really what have you done for me lately, even when teams have nine to ten games under their belt in November. Well, maybe it would have helped if Mario Cristobal learns how to manage a clock. That could have helped Tyler Van Dyke. That, that's maybe. something that I think Miami fans would like to see, although I'm quickly realizing Hurricanes <laughs> Twitter is an absolutely wild place because they will defend Mario Cristobal to the ends of the earth, talking about how, no, it's the talent not achieving what they expected, more so than Mario having the fact that he was the common denominator in Justin Herbert not really throwing the ball downfield. We've seen the erosion of quarterback play at Miami. And Lord only knows what it'll mean for Cam Ward when he takes over under center down there in Coral Gables this season. I wasn't going to ask you about this, but Kane's Twitter versus Vol's Twitter, which one's more aggressive? You know, it's fascinating because I think both have a lot of similarities, <laughs> given the fact that they are entitled fan bases who come from <laughs> blue blood programs who really haven't won much at a higher level uh, over the last decade or so. Now, I will give Tennessee fans credit because they're starting to see glimpses of Josh Heupel and what they can do. Uh, but that was fun last year going down the Joe Milton wormhole when oh, I try gosh. to tell people in and around that Nashville area, since I do a lot of radio with those folks and on Twitter, that it was going to be a substantial downgrade in terms of command of the offense from Hendon Hooker being a consummate pro to what Joe Milton could do. Uh, and I used to default to the Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite. Mm -hmm. Joe Milton may be able to throw the football over those mountains over there, but he's not going to be able to lead an offense. And I think Vols fans quickly realized that they were going to have a ceiling as a result. Miami fans, uh, I think it's as fun, much fun as anything else. We know they have some of the deepest pockets going out there, but until Mario can get this team to 10 wins, uh, I just kind of treat them at arm's length, give them a stiff arm, uh, and let them try and basically yell into the ether, hoping that somebody will hear their praises and they can regain the glory of those Ray Lewis Ed Reed years. <laughs> Might be a while. Might be a while for Mario. So. We all the biggest story of the offseason. We had a running joke when I was at CBS where, like, if you took a step away from you know from your computer for like a day or two, it's like, okay, ping me if Nick Saban retires. And then Nick Saban actually did retire in January. <laughs> Kalen DeBoer's in. How if you're if you're pick if you're examining Alabama from a win total perspective, from an SEC championship perspective, and it, the, the personnel is the personnel. I get that, but. How much of a factor is Nick Saban and how much of a downgrade in terms of how odds makers look at Alabama is a Kalen DeBoer led Alabama team? Uh, I think it's a, a decent downgrade only in the fact that what you've seen already from Alabama is their inability to retain some key cogs that entered the transfer portal because Alabama had kind of defaulted to having that Nick Saban factor. Look, uh, and I, you're closer to the Alabama community and in and around the SEC than I am, but I've been told from some sources that I really respect that their NIL isn't anywhere close to a lot of the top sure. tier programs because they didn't think they were going to need that infrastructure in place almost overnight. So what happens is players leave. Kalen DeBoer now has to institute his own systems. And I'd be lying if I said I was 100% confident that Jalen Milrow was a perfect fit for what Kalen DeBoer wants to do offensively. I kind of joked that, you know what, maybe there's a program right down the road in the Plains at Jordan Hare, that might be a much better fit for Jalen Milrow's skill sets to take Auburn to the next level. So you look at Alabama, and there's a reason that they're now fourth favorite in the SEC behind, you know, new entrant in Texas, Georgia, who has become the gold standard, and something that I didn't think we'd say when Nick Saban was on campus there, that they are behind Ole Miss in terms of odds makers projections uh, to win the conference. You look at Alabama's win total at nine and a half. It's one of the lowest that I can remember going all the way back to Nick Saban's first few years. And this coming bear from a guy who bet Alabama under 10 and a half wins last year, uh, thought with the loss to Texas, I was going to be sitting in the catbird seat. I did only too. to have my guts absolutely ripped out uh, with the Jalen Milrow miracle down there at Jordan Hare. And not only did it hurt losing the Alabama under, I actually had an Auburn over win total ticket as well. So oh. it was the worst of both worlds. Uh, and I think the market's going to be interesting to see how they respond 
But if you use the Georgia game as a litmus test, we saw that game right around Pickham when Nick Saban uh, was on campus and when Nick Saban retired and some of the player defections, that number has moved more into that three. And I think it may leak even a little bit further until Alabama knows exactly what they have coming into the season. Uh, Todd, earlier this week on the show, we examined power four conference title odds. And it was interesting in the Big Ten because you had a group, Ohio State, Michigan, uh, Oregon, and Penn State, that were not necessarily even, but you could. there was a line of delineation after those four to USC. And I, I am totally on board with that because I am not buying USC at all because I think the shine has worn off on Lincoln Riley. Is that the case now with odds makers as well? Yeah, I think USC is one of those wait and see teams. And this was a program that came in with all the momentum in the world into last season. They took a ton of money from professional betters over their win total going into the 2023 season. And we knew their schedule was going to be stratified. The first six games were glorified exhibitions, but you saw kinks in the armor for SC against some of those inferior foes, not being able to get that level of separation. And then the wheels kind of fell off uh, over the final handful of games. And you don't have a transcendent talent to lean on now like he did last year with Caleb Williams. Miller Moss was great, assuming that he wins the starting job in the bowl game. But a bowl game against Louisville isn't exactly what it's going to be in terms of a litmus test going forward in the conference. So I'm perfectly fine with the way the uh, Big Ten sets up now. I'm very curious to see how the travel will impact some of these teams with multiple trips across multiple time zones. You know, whether it's the teams from the East Coast traveling out to the West Coast or teams from the West going into inclement weather uh, as we get deeper into the calendar in November. Uh, and Barrett, USC is a team that when I don't have a bet down either against them or on them, that I find themselves rooting for because, as you know, happy wife equals happy life. It's true. And my wife is a proud alum of USC but has not seen them win a national championship uh, having graduated after Pete Carroll left and having sat in Allegiant Stadium when Caleb Williams tore his hamstring in the Pac-12 championship game. I'm pretty sure she blamed me for some of their play calling <laughs> as much as she did the USC coaching staff. So it really is, in my opinion, is a separation of has and have nots. The one thing that does surprise me, though, and I'll be honest here, I'm not sure I'd be making a case at all for Michigan at such a short number there. Coach Harbaugh meant so much to that team that I want to see how Sharon Moore leads this group. We've seen some coaching staff defections as well, a change at the quarterback position. Uh, and I'm very curious to see how Michigan will perform this year both from a win total standpoint and their ability to compete with Ohio State and Oregon for bragging rights in the Big Ten Conference. This is the last thing, and this has nothing really to do with college football. It more has to do with the industry itself. We've seen legalized sports gambling just continue to grow throughout the course of the, of the last five, six, seven years. Uh, from, from your perspective, just how has that process been, having done this when essentially it was just Las Vegas and nowhere else? So we'll go glass half full and we'll offer a doomsday prophecy as well <laughs> because we want to try and make sure that we can run the full gamut here. I think what's great about the influx of legalized sports betting and more and more operators getting into a variety of states is that you have menus that are much more extensive and expansive than we've ever seen in the past. I mean, we mentioned at the top win totals and game of the year numbers that are out before the calendar even gets to March would have been unthinkable. Uh, when Nevada was the only state offer, uh, offering legalized and regulated sports betting. So in that regard, it's great. I love the fact that people have more ways to bet than ever before. On the flip side, I actually thought legalized sports betting would make it easier for professionals to move larger sums to bet into some of these markets, knowing that you know the Fanatics, the FanDuel's, the DraftKings, the Caesars, the MGMs of the world now had a much larger footprint. They had more liquidity coming in. But it's actually gone the opposite way, other than a few select books, that it's harder for professionals to get fair limits. You're limited pretty quickly in terms of your ability to get down. And so it becomes a cat and mouse game uh, with a lot of these betting markets that are out there, that it's a golden age for a small stakes better that trusts his or her college football numbers to get down early. But a lot of pros don't want to tip their hands until they can move enough freight. So that's the catch 22 we're in. I hope it gets better. I'm not optimistic there but it's not at all a doomsday prophecy by any stretch, knowing that more and more people that are college football enthusiasts have an opportunity to get down and bet in a comfortable, legalized, and regulated market with new states coming online every day and North Carolina soon to enter the fray uh, over the next 10 days or so. Whatever you can do to get Georgia, I would 
greatly appreciate that. So look, I mean, we may mo- both know a lot of the same people, uh, but it's all about the political machine and trying to push it across the finish line. I am optimistic that George is going to get here sooner rather than later. Uh, it's just a question of how quickly that'll transpire. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not sure it'll be there by the start of college football season 2023. Needs to happen. Needs to happen. Todd, appreciate it. Pump uh, pump your uh, your info. Where do you find your uh, content and uh, Twitter and X and all that other stuff? Hey, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, folks can follow me on X uh, at Todd Furman. Uh, a lot of content across all the differing gambling genres, so to speak. Uh, not as much college football and NFL content now. I am a big NASCAR fan, so we do the Stay Green podcast every week. Have a great episode. Uh, just in time for the race in Vegas, but we'll be with folks for out, throughout the stretch of schedule there. Uh, you can find me on CBS Sports HQ, do, talking a little gambling, probably more NHL than anything else. And I know there may not be a lot of overlap on that Venn diagram, Barrett, for your audience and hockey fans that are out there. Uh, but every Monday and Tuesday, as part of the NHL YouTube, they can check out the uh, Puck Line show. We break down a couple of games, a little more, more casual look at the slate through a gambling lens, but plenty of ways to get your gambling fixed if you don't get sick of this ugly mug or this (laughs) annoying nasally voice. Well, I tell you what, when the Thrashers come back, and not if, but when the Thrashers come back, (laughs) uh, I will gladly join your hockey podcast and tell you how much the Thrashers... uh, Look, they're going to win the Stanley Cup. Now, I know for their existence, they went to the playoffs once, and they got swept by the Rangers. They will at least win a playoff game before 2030 because they are coming back before 2030. You know, Barrett, the question there, do we think they bring back the Thrasher's logo or what direction to. What direction are we going in? I mean, is there any creative buzz in terms of what the third iteration of the <laughs> NHL in Atlanta would look like? Since we know the Atlanta Flames fizzled, the Atlanta Thrashers didn't quite cut it, but all the talk down there you can speak to, it's all about placement of stadiums and ballparks. Yeah. Apparently that's all it takes for professional sports to thrive. Uh, in the big egg. Well, it also takes good management because the first two ownership groups for the Flames and Very Thrashers, fair. respect, they hated hockey. <laughs> <laughs> they just did. This one's going to happen, though. They better bring that the name, too. And the colors, because it was pretty solid. Todd, appreciate it. Always a pleasure, my friend. That'll do it for this edition of College Football Smothered and Covered. Really appreciate you checking the show out. Reminder to scr- to, a reminder to subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of that stuff. I really appreciate you over the last month checking the show out and giving all the positive and negative reviews. That really does matter to me. And so we will keep this going. Enjoy your Friday, everybody, except, uh, you know, There might be more if breaking news happens Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, whenever. I will be out all week next week, but there will be shows throughout the course of the week. Maybe not every day, but we'll try to do them as much as possible while I am in Disney World. Might be audio only, but even if they're audio only, they do pop up on the YouTube channel. They will have those little audio lines from Red Circle, but still, they will be there. Enjoy your Friday.